Welcome, Chris, from your building, your man cave. We are Zooming again, aren't we? We are social distancing. Yes, sir. I have the I have the TV up there. I got the speakers out there. I got the uh, woodworking, whatever. It's an awesome little place, man. It doesn't look pretty, though, does it? No, I was going to say this might be our answer to video, but we'll have to clean up your space. There's a rake, a rake and a shovel behind you and a blower, it looks like, on a shelf. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Definitely got to get a better background there. I use them once a year. Welcome to another edition of Through a Therapist's Eyes. You are Greg Graves. I am Chris Gazdick, where we do again invite you to see the world through the lens of a mental health and substance abuse therapist with the goal to create emotional growth. Uh, being aware this is not the delivery of therapy services in any way. We are looking for feedback, discussion. Craig, this one might be a little bit of a fun chat because we're talking about mass media, right? People right. might people might want to chime in on this one. We might get like bombed on this one <laughs> <laughs> on the website through a Uh Boy, in the media, it is definitely the human emotional experience. So we're going to do our best to figure this thing out together. We got uh, two shows in a row. We we're gonna we're gonna have third voice, man. We got we got another big help on this show. You, you think we need any help with the mass media, Craig? I'm 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 excited. I'm excited about the guest. Definitely am. Yeah. Why is that? Because we're gonna talk about media, and I think he has some expertise there. <laughs> he does. He does. Mr. Roger Sorrow, thank you so much for joining us this this episode, man. I'm. I am told that you are, uh, oh, I know actually that you have God, just an incredibly long experience with all this stuff in, in, in the world of media. Um, you have been not only a reporter, you've been a producer, you've been a talk show host, you've been a program director, you've been a news director. Craig, this guy's also been a station director. This guy has been retired. I think you said, Mr. Sar from the before the mics came out for five years, you've been retired. So that, that must mean you started working in the media at about 1923. Yeah. I'm, I'm about older than dirt. If, if, <laughs> if, what, uh, if, if, if I were a tree, you'd be sawing me apart and making me into furniture by now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. No, actually I'm incredibly youthful. Yes. Yeah, you are youthful at heart, man. Tell us what you've done in your experience. How did I do with your intro? What, what, what makes you you? Uh, what do you know about the media? How, how, how have you been faring in this industry? It's really interesting because once you go through a you know, good long career, you sometimes have the, the, the luck, the good luck to go back and say, hey, I wound up doing what I said I wanted to do as a kid. Uh, it had its ups and downs like any career I think has, but um, I've worked uh, – in radio, especially radio broadcasting, since 1975. Nice. Uh, and I know that, you know, uh, conversations come up that I've had with you prior where, like, you and Craig, essentially, that's when you guys were born, essentially. <laughs> 1973. You know, in, in diapers, when, when I was out uh, trying to write news stories for our radio station. So uh, it's incredible when you look at the durability of something like radio, which really got started in the commercially in the 1920s in the US. And yet, when you look at these last few years of my career and our joint experience with the mass media, it's just exploded with all the digital stuff that's going on. So hopefully we can talk about those things. I'm sure that um, as we're here listening to this, for many of us, we're in March of uh, 2020 and just really we're all trying to cope with the coronavirus, what that yeah. means, what our fears are. And certainly it is topic number one on virtually any radio station, any TV station, newspaper you can think of, news magazine, and certainly all over the internet, for better or for worse. Craig, so, you know, you know have any idea, amazing. Craig, what he's talking about, the, the corona beer? Is that, what is he talking about? Corona beer. Yeah, that's what we need. We need more of Corona beer unless you have fun. <laughs> hey, I, yeah. I've got it. Can I ask a question of you two guys? I know that, well, I was listening to a recent show you did and like, you know, you were talking about the media and the darn media and, 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 and how that goes into sort of stirring up hysteria about, uh, about the virus uh, epidemic. So like, when is the last time that you read a story 
on the internet about coronavirus? Was it 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, half an hour earlier in the day? When's the last time that either of you read something, looked up something, listened to something on, on the web, not on radio or TV? Um, right before we talked to our last guest, about, about an hour and a half or two ago. Okay. okay. I saw that, uh, I think his name's Mark Bloom. He's an actor. He passed away as a result of coronavirus complications. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 I saw, how about you? I think, for, I think for me, I did pop on in the middle of a session uh, this afternoon because there was a question and I was in a therapy session. So I, I honestly, I can't even remember what it was about though or why I did it. So I think it was numbers. Day. It was yeah. numbers. Yeah. yeah. The point I'd like to try to start out with is is like to say, okay, you, you saw this piece or you saw a clip on the web or you read a post that somebody did, but did you really know who wrote it? And you presume you did, but beyond that, if you, if you presume you knew who wrote it, how can you be sure? And I think that's sort of a, a, an illustration of what has happened with one little piece of what's happening with mass media when it when it's converted to the web you have this e explosion of sources but i think one of the things that you know reflects the profession and really should you know uh, should uh impact any one of us is how do we really know what we're reading where it comes from how much how credulity should we put in any individual story? And I, I think that's something, you know, hopefully that we can talk about during the hour too. Because you know, I think that's interesting I think because there are a lot Roger, of open you're, questions. You're right, man. I mean, you know, it, it really is such a different beast. I mean, part of what I want to get from you, because there's, there is so much uh, thought out there about the impact of the media and how the media works. And, and you raise an interesting point. Craig, I, I'm going to be honest. I couldn't tell you who the source was for mine. Did you know who the source was for you when you popped on there? I don't know who the source was. It was on the Apple News app. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, because I don't know you who know, wrote it or what public publication they work for or anything like that. Sure. But yet it's an sure. interesting thing because we are snap, snap, snap in the moment and we'll pop on to get something. I will literally now yell across my room, uh, hey, okay, Google. What was the blah 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 blah, right? And that right. is a and you get very served up an answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, absolutely. You know, <clears throat> for me, starting out this this show, I, I wanted to go back to uh, college. Uh, it it was because obviously this is a mental health and substance abuse show, right? Like it, it was it was it was weird for me. Because I was an MSW student and a public administration uh, double student, I ended up dropping my double major and, and just went with uh, with, with my, my, my my social work stuff. <clears throat> but when I was in the public administration classes, we 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 did a class, and I forget what you know the class was on even. But the professor asked a fundamental question, and and, and for discussion on that lecture on that day, and they just asked, "What effect does the media have?" How important to society is the media? And I'm gonna be honest with you, maybe it was just being airheady or whatever. I, I I was surprised by the question because I think it was a government class or something that we were taking. And the topics you would think of would be making law and you know the administration of policies and this, that, and the other. And I just remember being kind of surprised by that. Um and it made me ever since that moment, ever since being asked that question and being kind of, you know, shocked in the moment of that, I've always thought how powerful the media is psychologically, how, how, how devastatingly powerful what you hear you bet. it is, it is over the top. Well, and especially not only to a person's mindset, especially in a time of crisis like coronavirus and am I going to stay healthy? What's going to happen in my community? Can my family be healthy? But, you know, you're talking about studying government and think about the fact that so much of what happens is, is conveyed through media and certainly is questioned through the media. You, you come back, you know, from the earliest days of the U.S., look at it. The First Amendment to the Constitution, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press 
or the right for people to peacefully assemble and then petition the government for a redress of grievances. It was the First Amendment that allowed for uh, and insisted on freedom of the press. And, you know, it is to this day a fundamental, you know, a fundamental tenet that you need a uh, free press, also sort of uh, an aggressive press to to question government, to act as a surrogate for citizens all across you know, the land and try to make sure that government is really doing the will of the people and acting in the people's interests, uh, even though oftentimes it just irritates the hell out of lawmakers and, and, and public servants and, uh, and folks who um, I'm sure are, are fine in some ways finding their lives more um, complicated when they try to deal with the coronavirus now and deal with the media at the same time. Um, so, you know, it, it's been there since the earliest days that, that the journalism that the free press, I say press, largely, of course, you know, thinking of printing presses back in the 1700s would just be a real key part of reacting to government and being a foil to government and making sure that uh, you know, government would evolve in the U.S. in a democratic way. You know, listening to you, to me, it just sounds very psychological. It, 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 it almost, the words that came to my mind just listening to you right there was power struggle. Sure. Yeah, like a, like a power struggle for, for people to have a voice and to be, is, is that what media is about? Well, I was I mean, going to say, yeah, when you talk yeah. about po power struggle, I'll take you back again to the early days. You could say if you're talking about, you know, the forming of the U.S. government, you know, you really, it's a power struggle. And in fact, we're fighting, you know, between the president and Congress right now on those issues. We're, we're revisiting the idea of divided government as being what the founders wanted, you know, divided between the president, the executive the Congress, the courts, and really, you know, what, what for years and years have people called the press, the fourth estate, you know, if you will, sort of the, the kind of informal, distant, but yet very powerful kind of shadow government in terms of questioning what's going on and also advocating for policies that, that might be in the public interest. Um, so, you know, it, it's been there for a long term. You got to say, you know, it, it's always kind of tempting when people talk about the media. Um, you know, I like to kid and say, yeah, I'm from the damn media because yeah. you know, we certainly realize that, you know, we have the possibility of really irritating people and looking obstructive and looking sensational, um, as well as being, you know, key to uh, freedom of speech and to the, you know, the progress of, uh, of uh, the democratic, democratic system here in the U.S. Roger, um, let me just kind of, let me tell you the way I see it. I mean, I don't dislike oh, the oh, media. I mean, sure. I, I do and I don't. I believe what you said is absolutely true. We need the media to question our government, our government officials, and keep everybody in check. But, you know, if you listen to a couple of news channels, they sound like they're a part of the Democratic uh, National Party. And if you sure. listen to others, they sound like they're part of the Republican Party. Yep. And they don't do that. I mean, they can have one guy on there, and they just – well, I'm going to use some language. They kiss his ass. Then uh -huh. they get another guy from the other party, and they drag him through the mud. I'd like for the media just to tell me the facts and shut up about the rest, you know? So has it always been that way? Have we always had a left or right leaning news, news outlets? I remember Walter Cronkite when I was a kid and my recollection is he sat there and read the news for 30 minutes and then we watched Jefferson's or something, you know? Um, has it always been this way? Frankly, I'm going to say yes, it has been. <laughs> Again, if you really want to go back to the founding, look at all the agitation and the irritation that went on back, you know, at the point when we were breaking away from England, you know, and there was a, there, there was a whole tradition of dissidents, you know, doing little leaflets, pamphleteering, you know, and when they were caught, caught by the British governors and their enforcers, you know, these people would be arrested and jailed. You know, but yet there are all sorts of pamphleteers that, you know, that, that, that really helped form a lot of the ideas about democracy that turned out to be, you know, part of the Declaration of Independence and, you know, the eventual formation of government. Um, you know, that happened back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And again, here we're obviously talking about print journalism, largely newspapers. 
there was this whole set of newspapers, you know, and they were basically called the yellow press. Some of them were actually printed on yellow paper and they were like sold for a penny and they were incredibly sensational. It was just no holds barred, you know, and there have been various duels and knife fights, you know, fought between politicians and other, you know, and others when uh, largely men, when they felt their honor was being besmirched by somebody who, you know, called them murderers and thieves and worse, you know, in print. So, you know, that's happened all through the years. So, I mean, yeah, there was a long, long tendency of that. There's one thing I read about, which is kind of interesting. You talk about the invention, you know, how did mass media start? Well, let's, let's go back a few days. Let's go back to the 1500s. Really, the mass media started to come from the invention of the printing press, Gutenberg, others, you know, in Germany in the late 1500s. And when you read some of the history, you find that as soon as the printing press was developed, and it was, and all of a sudden books and other, you know, pamphlets could be done cheaply for the masses before then everything was hand copied by monks. Okay, but once you got cheap printing things, uh, dissidents started to publish. And when they published, they were repressed by governments, princes and dukes and royals and dictators who didn't like to be questioned. So, you know, it goes back, you know, really, you know, to those particular ages. So that's one thing that happened. Um, can we, well, uh, before we get too far into this, you know, we're throwing around the, the term media, mass media, and maybe we ought to do a little defining of that. Does it make kind of any sense to it? And again, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to show my age right now in this because I too sort of have a real dividing line in my own mind that I sometimes have to jump over. And, but I tend to think it's fair to look at mass media as being newspapering, certainly in printing, sort of the print world out there, freedom of the press. And what followed you know, that, of course, was radio, which really comes from the 1920s, uh, and then you know, television. And then, you know, just what you all have grown up with being kind of one generation younger than I am, that idea of all of the web enabled, internet enabled uh, devices and, and, and bots and, and apps and all these kinds of things, which you can argue a little bit, you know, in, in, some of them are extremely powerful, you know, Facebook reaching billions of people. Well, you could argue that's a mass medium, you know, mm -hmm. counts, you know, for billions of people, but also there's sort of a one-to-one -one component to it in certain circumstances when you think about it. So, I, you know, that, that's its own special world. And I think we kind of have to divide between these, you know, those two. And also, if you talk about mass media, um, I think you can talk about the issue of regulation, which goes a lot to, you know, Craig, what you're talking about with somebody like Walter Cronkite, who was at one point when he was broadcasting the news for CBS regarded as the most trusted human being in the United States, if not the world. Um, and that's the fact that basically print newspapers have, in my sense, and I'm not a lawyer, but I would say in my sense, they have the clearest call on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, the Constitution. There you go. Uh, the, the government shall, Congress shall do nothing to abridge the freedom of speech or of the press, period. You got a press, you got freedom. Um, and largely what's happened in uh, printed media is that the government has had little or no ability to come in and censor something that is printed. Um, you know, printing presses are privately owned, or you could, you know, Xerox something or just write it up by hand, distribute it, boom, it's out there. So a lot of the legal correctives, the sanctions, the punishments that would come from doing something bad in the press, in the printed press, have been after the fact. In other words, it's almost impossible for the government to get what's called prior restraint, to stop you from publishing something. But for instance, if you libel somebody, tell a lie about somebody in the press, you can be punished after the fact. So usually legal process happens after something's published, but you're gonna be able to get it out there. Okay, so that's the print in the world. But when you got to radio and you got to television, those forms of mass media are regulated by the federal government. They always have been really since you know, the 1920s with radio. We can talk okay, about that more in a minute, but that brings up a whole thing where you have the government being able to exercise what it calls the public interest. Yeah, before you, before you get into yeah. the regulation, I knew we were going to go there at some point, Roger. I'm, I'm, I'm just listening. I'm trying to wrap my head around all this, and, I'm try, and, and I see it through the lens of you know, the psychology and the emotion that kind of goes sure. into it. And <clears throat> I, see, I see kind of a dynamic. 
I mean, that's a big statement that, you know, the way media has operated is actually largely the same back long ago, all the way through till, till today. Because, I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you is what have you seen change? I guess you're going into that with radio and TV as you started to, to talk about there. But I, I guess I guess I'm curious in your, what, like 40-year experience, 50-year experience or so of of really being involved and wrapping your brain around how how this works. What are the emotions of it? You know, I mean, is, is there – I don't even know how to ask what I want to frame up. Like, you know, Hitler had a guy in Germany that was like very viciously creating the narrative sure. around the whole country. Goebbels, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, and I, 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 that movie sticks out in my brain the way that happened. It, it kind of scared me. It was like, holy cow. And then we got, you know, the Rush Limbaugh's that that create this this sort of personality and then, and then we get, you know, Walter Cronkite, my, my personal favorite, you know, guy, you know, I go back, I, I love Larry King. I wish, I wish he could be on the airwaves forever. But the, I guess what I'm saying is how much of the agenda and how, how does the agenda of the speaker or the channel or the, the administration, the free agency dictate what is happening in the mass media? Because I, I have the impression that that's different now than it used to be. Yes, it's different. I think, again, if you talk about more of the traditional mass media, you know, for sake of argument, I'd argue that as we talk about this, we sort of have one bucket we call traditional mass media, and that would be print, radio, television. Okay, just kind of spot me that for the, for the purpose of, of some of the early part of the conversation. And, you know, are they in, in the traditional mass media, are you know, our folks, our professionals involved in like, you know, having, setting an agenda. Absolutely. You know, very, very clearly. I was going to say, if you look at kind of what the roles have been, there, there are, certainly have been in the mass media gatekeepers. Uh, you know, people acknowledge that. They thought that was important. Gatekeepers, you know, included reporters, editors, news directors, assignment editors. You know, those, those were a bunch of the things that I said I did in my career. People yeah. who did, and those are people. Another way of saying, you know, gatekeepers. These are people who determine what gets covered or not in that traditional bucket of of, of mass media. Um, Do we have and, gatekeepers today? Oh sure. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And are we being I, are we being gatekeep kept now? In this sure. room? Yes. How? What? What a good thing. What a good thing. Well, uh, you know, go turn on ABC Evening News, turn on MSNBC, uh, you know, turn on any, uh, you know, virtual. And, and again, the one I just said, MSNBC, that's a little bit different, too, because that is cable television. That's a little different. You know, it's not really broadcast it's put out over the air. It's a function of, you know, cable distribution, which is a whole creature of like the 1980s and 90s. Um, but not only is it there, but I think largely in the professions, you would see it as being necessary and also um, uh, positive. In other words, you, if you're in that business, now don't, don't disagree with me yet. <laughs> I see you're getting very, very edgy about this, but I was going to say you could argue that, you know, that is seen gatekeepers as sort of being quality control. You know, that's professionalism. Now, you can certainly argue with that. And maybe you will. No, no. I was just, I was just pointing out in my mind: Are we being gate kept now? Like the three yes. of us, we're having a conversation, oh. right, right, right. We're having a conversation, and 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 I wonder how the psychology of the media has changed in in the plethora of information that's available. Because I think you know, Craig and I were talking at one point, right? Like, do, do are we? We're a part of the media right now. Yes. Right. Like. How are we being gated in this conversation and how much of a different amount of gatekeeping goes on? We don't have an editor. We don't have a producer. We don't have uh, somebody over our heads. We can say anything that we want to say. Oh, right. Can we? No, no, no. Well, for instance, okay, let me point out a couple just again to say, you know, I'll say, first of all, what we're doing right now, when we put it in bucket number two, which is sort of the new age of media that we're talking about, the internet and all things. But if you talk about gatekeepers, number one, um, can you talk about Craig's neighbor 
and and call him out by name you don't even have to use his name but say you know this is the person who lives next to craig graves and this per person happens to be an embezzler okay if you do that craig's neighbor may not be real happy with you and may sue you uh for libel and if they can prove the case that it's that you recklessly disregarded the truth and what you said was false he probably has grounds for a libel suit so yeah they're still there okay the other thing okay. would be okay you are a counselor you're a therapist aren't you yes sir think of all the guidelines you have in place by your professional association that would censor you if you do things that they consider to be beyond the norms of the profession and hipaa guidelines to which are federal so yeah there's a lot of gatekeeping out there i would say almost for you know, and and and, okay. and 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 I think the point is, if I'm doing it, it's professional quality, okay. And if you're doing it to me, it's gatekeeping, or worse. Right, <laughs> right, of course. On. Which side of the table are you sitting? Does that make any sense at That's, all? Yeah, I guess you're right. I, you know, you can't just get on and say anything that you want to say whenever you want to say it because we do have laws and we do have restrictions and we do have limits. So. I, I tell you, one of the things that I feel like, still though that being said, um, I, I wonder about, you know, how how regulated the media is or needs to be, so that we don't have a runaway agenda, such as people claim is going on all the time, to to be reckless and dangerous. When does sure. when when does the psychology come into play? where it can be reckless and dangerous, you know, hurting basic fabrics of our society. Do, do we, you know, how, how can we regulate that? Do we need that? Sure. Can I talk first about, you mentioned psychology of people in the business and that, um, and, and then go from that a little bit into that more of the issue of regulation. Can I go there first for a second? Sure. Because when we talk about the psychology of people who are in the media, um, most of us are deranged. Most of us need, you know, a tremendous amount of help. Um, you know, the, we're, we're really you need help, Greg. You need help, man. We are deranged. <laughs> now, I was going to say one of the things that I think you would see all the way through that you know there is a culture that builds. I mean, most most journalists, not all of them. If you're talking about journalists, are trained in colleges, uh, and then you know get a professional degree all those there's no real certification like there is for social workers you know you could you, you can come to the media with a broad range of backgrounds but essentially one of the things that you know going back from this first amendment deal you tend to you know to wind up um having a psychological mindset where you question authority because you know you're there to question government to ask hard questions to people so there tends to be a, a fairly strong anti-authoritarian streak among, uh, especially I'm talking about journalists, people over okay. the news side. Okay. Interesting. The culture of journalism is okay. Question of authority. Go ahead, Go ahead Craig. And <laughs> well, I was going to say I, I get that, and I appreciate that that uh, that that I, honesty. <laughs> I, well, I don't know how to phrase it because, like I said before. I mean, you put a Republican on CNN sure. and a Democrat on CNN, you get, I mean, they'll question and that watch out. a lot harder than they do the Democrat. And the same thing on Fox. You put a Republican on there, it's like, oh yeah, you know, had a boy, good job. You put a Democrat on there, it's a different story. So it's like they sure. question the authority of one government official more than they do the other. And people who, and you know what? When you start talking about that, I would argue that it goes back to issues of policy and regulation. And, and for those people, you know, I won't say you can thank any particular person or persons for what's happening now in the media, but it's an interaction of folks like Congress, the trade group that's called the National Association of Broadcasters, the Federal Communications Commission, Ronald Reagan, all ha and, and the almighty dollar all had a lot to do with how we've gotten to this kind of, you know, super combative, super charged narrative, uh, you know, especially if you look at radio or TV, especially, you know, television. So it goes this way. 
Um, remember I said that radio and television are regulated by the federal government. They have essentially been since their invention, radio in the 1920s, essentially, as it became a mass medium. And that's because radio and television use when they broadcast over the air, okay, think the conventional TV, the conventional radio, radio like you hear in your car, unless you're talking about satellite radio, these things use spectrum, right? And spectrum is scarce. And the regulation in the U.S. has developed that the radio and TV spectrum are essentially owned by us, owned by the citizens, not by the broadcasters themselves. So the broadcasters essentially have applied to the FCC um, starting in the 1920s and asked for a license for a limited amount of time to use this public resource, sort of like the air. Or you Wait a minute. Yeah, you're, so hold, hold on. So you're saying yeah. the spectrum, the air the spectrum. that's out there, the, the, the electromagnetic the radio waves spectrum. that go out there is yeah. owned by the people, right? And 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 not any government or entity. God love you. It's owned by you and Craig and by me. By, okay. By everybody. Okay. okay. And if you're a broadcaster, you go to the FCC and say, say, I would like to go into business. Or, you know, if you're a, a non-commercial broadcaster, you say, I want to offer service to the public and I'm not going to make money off it personally. Will you please give me a license? And the licensing started from technical grounds. Basically, when you had radio back in the, in the 1920s, people just threw up radio stations wherever they wanted to across the country. And what happened? Obviously, they interfered with each other. And when radio signals interfere with each other, they cancel each other out. So this was a total mess. And finally, Congress in the 1920s said, oh, you know, we've got to do something. We've got to clean this up. It's the Wild West on the air. So they set up essentially what became the Federal Communications Commission. Um, okay, so that led to, broad, to, to, to rules. Well, what to put on the air? Largely, the content was unregulated through the end of the 20s into the 30s. And in the 1940s, the late 40s, the FCC took another look at this and said, you know, we ought to do something about regulation to see that radio stations, and this is about the time TV was starting to come on in the late 1940s, the TV ought to not only technically not interfere stations with each other, but we ought to see that what's on the air has some sense of worth to it. So they set up um, a doctrine that's called the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, and I believe the year was 1947 and essentially it said at least two things to broadcasters, most of them were radio. One, if you're a broadcaster, you've got to, you have to broadcast coverage of issues that are controversial and of your community's interest. You gotta do that. And what that means is you just simply couldn't go and play records all day long or do live music broadcasts all day long, just do happy talk. You had to you know, essentially have a news department or a public affairs department, okay. That was point one. Number two, when you do that, you're obligated to be fair about it, i.e. that's what's called the fairness doctrine, and that you will guarantee to us that you will present diverse views um, on issues that are compelling in your community of controversial issues. You got to do that. You got to cover them and you got to be fair in what you do and really make a good faith effort to cover equal sides. Okay, so, so let's, let's dumb this down for yeah. me. So we got the air yeah. and we've got, you know, Jimmy John, who wants to create a media outlet. Right. And I threw them all up in the 20s, and it was a mess because you couldn't hear anything. It was just all yeah. static. So the government they interfered with each other. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go ahead and, and, and fix this straight up so that we can actually get some good media out there with this new thing called a radio right. and then with the TV. But so I have to come to you now and get a license to do that. Right. But, but if I'm going to do that, I got to cover news. I can't just play records and whatever. Or do public affairs programs, you know, if you so I got to do some sort of, do, right. that's what you're requiring for me. And right. I got to be fair and impartial about right. it. And I've got to prove it when it comes up to license renewal time. Okay. And I have to prove that I'm fair and giving news stories. Right, right, right. To okay. be on the air. Okay. And the other thing, there's one more rule. I hate to have a psychology program that talks all about rules, but in the, in, you know, regulation, but there's one other real big piece of this and that's, uh, equal time for politicians. It, when you got into election time, part of this regulation showed that if you have one political candidate on, you have to give equal time to his or her opponents. That's the equal time rule. Now, okay, so that's the way it went. 
And before we sort of, you know, switch to another topic, that went along merrily through the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, at which point there got to be more and more radio stations, TVs there, radio's kind of fading. It really has just become kind of top 40 radio again. And then basically when you get to the Reagan era, um, you've got actors like the, the, the lobbying group for broadcasters called the National Broadcasters Association and Congress. And then the conservatives in the, in the Reagan administration basically said, you know, we don't need that anymore. There are so many radio stations on the air now. And I believe the number is, it would be less back in the 1980s, but if you talk about current day, it's about 10,000 radio stations in the U.S., AM and FM combined, about 10,000. So, you know, there is no, no worry any more about scarcity of radio stations. There are all these diverse viewpoints. Uh, a station, a community like Charlotte, North Carolina had 40 or 50 radio stations, still does. So there's a whole diversity of viewpoints. We don't need these rules anymore. So they were dropped. The Fairness Doctrine was essentially taken off the federal books in the early 80s. You know what that led to? CNN. Doing radio Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh's program would have been impossible to, to, to air uh, because it was essentially, it is a, you know, a very strong, uh, it doesn't matter which side it was, the fact that it's essentially a, you know, a one-sided uh, uh, political and, and sociological viewpoint. That would not, was not allowed during the old days of the Fairness Doctrine. And as soon as, as that was eliminated, it, uh, it allowed legally that kind of show to go forward. These, these heavy opinion shows with no attempt to have essentially equal amounts of time or diverse viewpoints. It could just be all liberal or all conservative and away you go. That's where they started. Fascinating. I did not know that. And then, okay, so, you know, you go forward, there's no more fairness doctrine. Um, and, and, and when I talk about that, back in the 1970s and 1980s, when I was first involved in broadcast management, you had to, re well, you still have to renew your radio or TV over the air licenses. You have to go back to the FCC. But at that point, you had to do what was called ascertainment as a station. You had to go out and interview political uh, uh, leaders, community leaders, nonprofit leaders in your coverage area, document that you talked about them. You'd ask them, what are the significant issues of public interest that we should be covering as this station? And you'd have to show the FCC then, you'd have to write up, you know, that you did that kind of ascertainment work and what you plan to do about it and how you served the public interest uh, in, in the prior years when, when you're under the, the previous uh, license term. So and, this and is that regulation is gone now. This is fascinating, and, and, and the reason why I say that is because yes, I am. You are, you are absolutely. You are fascinating personally in the sense that you're talking about the 1980s deregulation, and that's actually you're a program director. I mean, what did all we say? You're you're a talk show host a bunch on of radio. Stuff, yeah. You've been from the ground to the executive suites in the mass in industry, and honestly, right smack devil in the middle of your career. It just sounds like we had a major shift. Yeah. Right? So you have the first half of your career is, I would presume, very different than the whole second half of your career. Is that true? It's true. And <laughs> as you were saying that, uh, Chris, I've got to laugh and sort of say, well, you know, there were like world changing developments in the media and the technology hmm, every Tuesday and Thursday. I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. year after year after year, it seems like, there, you know, and uh, you know, and, and that's one of the things that really happens to the media when you talk about the psychology, the breakneck pace of the work. You know, imagine where you have a career that's, uh, that's based in minutes and seconds and literally seconds. You, you cannot be two or three seconds late in doing your work. You know, oftentimes if you're, if you're in a, a broadcast situation, pressure. Actually be pressure. Good. So you have that, you know, so that's kind of attribute number Two, we talked about attribute number one is sort of this anti-authoritarian mind nature, kind of punky nature that, you know, many people, especially in the broadcast news business, well, and the print business have had. So, uh, yeah, you know, and again, when we, I would say, with earth-shaking changes, you know, 
when the fairness doctrine was done away with, it just kind of like, well, who's this guy? He's out, I think it was Missouri or Kansas, Limbaugh is kind of this heavy set guy and he really rails for two or three hours every day and he doesn't have many guests in and he's got this huge audience, you know, what's happening here? Well, so we really didn't, you know, I think have a sense uh, that, uh, you know, how, how big it was as it happened. I mean, I think the real game changer again was all the, uh, you know, what I would call bucket two media, all the sort of web enabled internet, digital you know, uh, type, of, type of media. When that started to happen, that's what? 2000, late 90s, early 2000s? When did um, channels like CNN and Fox and those guys, when did they go downhill? When did they become so polarized and, and one-sided? I would argue, and again, maybe there'll be a TV historian who will uh, bring it right, right after listening to this newscast and, and say, hey, your guest was, was all, all, you know, just all wet. But I would say that something like a CNN had the ability to be, um, let's call it partisan or, you know, or, or, or overtly partisan or so did, you know, Fox News back from their inception because, um, the cable channels, and examples of those are like CNN, MSNBC, uh -huh. uh, and certain uh, Fox itself is such a, you know, a huge amount of different broadcast channels, li literally distribution channels, that I'll say Fox cable, okay, uh -huh. those things essentially have not been tightly regulated by the FCC because essentially they, they, they were not broadcast, they were delivered to your home by wire, okay. So they really never had those fairness doctrine um, uh, laws that, that hemmed them in as far as I knew. That was one thing. And again, they were- Really? Wait even, a minute. Had been so you're saying because it was wired cable on your telephone pole or whatever, sure. they didn't have to be regulated Absolutely. by the fair doctrine. Okay. Absolutely. They're, they're considered a utility, more like your- Really? Phone phone company or well think of the phone company you pick up remember ma bell okay if you're on the phone you could badmouth somebody you could swear on the phone and nobody regulated that well that was considered a utility if you will a common carrier and uh and i'm not an expert on this but as far as i know you would consider those cable services still common carriers okay now that's not confusing enough because look at all the places now where an msnbc or a fox news is delivered home not by literally by a wire, but we've cut the cords. So they're being delivered by satellite, but essentially it's a portion of the satellite distribution that is not regulated directly by the FCC in terms of content. Interesting. So the fairness doctrine wouldn't Which gets us saved Fox or CNN e either way. No, no, it, 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 it and so because there's no fa uh, fairness doctrine, it enabled them you know, to kind of do what they wanted to do. So you'd have that happening. And, and let, let's talk about one of the other major factors then, hyper competition, okay? Because go back when you guys were, you know, in kindergarten, you know, ask your parents, when they watch TV, they probably had three channels, maybe four, maybe five. That's all they could get. You know, I remember they put up that. the rabbit ears. They'd be getting the signals out of the air, right? You'd twist around the rabbit ears. Yeah. Um, we're talking in the region of Charlotte, North Carolina. So the big one was, uh, was the CBS affiliate, uh, the Channel 3 in Charlotte. That and a couple of others, but essentially you'd have the CBS over-the-air broadcaster, the NBC, the ABC, um, maybe public television, bless their hearts. And that was about it. Okay, so four. Okay, how many channels do you have access to now? Well, remember the what's the rock song? Was it called Fifty Stations or Five Hundred Stations and Nothing On? Yeah. Hey, remember that rock song? Well, that's based on the idea of cable. That all of a sudden, do you know where cable TV came from? Uh -huh. Mountainous areas. Okay, what happened if you couldn't even get the three or four stations? So. I forget whether it was upstate New York or in the Rocky Mountain villages, I think probably both, they had virtually no over the air TV stations because you can't get TV through a mountain. Wow. TV is line of sight, you hit a mountain, the signal stops. What do you yeah. do if you live on the other side of the mountain? Well, what you do is you get either the guy who sold TVs or you get the guy who ran the local telephone company to shinny up to the top of the mountain and put up a receiving dish and then hook an amplifier in it and run a cable down into the town and then put a splitter on it and send it all, you know, to all the, uh, the people in town who wanted more TV stations. And you brought in the distant stations 
and doubled or tripled or quadrupled, maybe, oh, goodness, maybe gave them 20 stations to watch. You know, and that was a big deal back in what, the 60s and 70s. And that's how cable television started. Interesting. I did not know that. And so, you know, then you had this dude sitting down in, um, down in um, uh, Atlanta and his dad was in the advertising business, but what he did was his dad was uh, huge in the, in the uh, billboard business around Atlanta. Well, son was trying to figure out, um, you know, what he could do to, he, he was kind of bored by the billboard business. And so I think he was out probably skiing or something, you know, around the mountains. He saw these guys shinning up the mountain to put up the TV receiver and do what was called community antenna television, CATV, which became cable. He said, well, that's kind of cool. But, you know, they need something more that's on. And, you know, they've got this weird thing now that's flying around. They've got these communication satellites that they're using. You know, I, I looked. You know, you watch Walter Cronkite on CBS and he's picking up this live, you know, this live news report from London. That's pretty cool. I wonder if I could do that. So his name was Ted Turner. Yeah. And uh, of course, what he invented was a thing called Cable News Network, CNN. He said, hey, yeah. why don't I just put this sucker up on the satellite and they can bring it down. You know, forget about the mountains. They will just set up a satellite receive dish you know, any place we want all around the country and we can work it in with those community antenna signals and there came CNN. Yeah. You know, and CNN used to be the go-to news source, right? I mean, that was, that was it. Um, you know, at some point, maybe I started paying attention, but it seems like it sprouted off into, into more of an agenda based, uh, news broadcast. Okay. So what I was saying is cable CNN used to be the network for reliable, (laughs) trusted news. And at some point it, it went off in a different direction, I guess, maybe. And why, why probably did that happen? Increasing competition. All of a sudden, it wasn't an issue of CNN against all the local broadcast stations. It was, you know, you name it, the number of cable, uh, uh, cable only providers um, who started to compete with uh, CNN. So, Roger, in your 40 year experience doing grounds, nuts and bolts, ground to ceiling of this thing, you know, the media gets really, really, really criticized. I mean, hard, you know, by the vast amount of our population. Do you think that's fair? And do you think the media has gotten better or worse, given some of what you're talking about with regulation and specifically, especially towards the psychology, the effects of all of that? I'm very worried about people losing a sense of discernment in terms of what they're picking up, especially in bucket number two, which is, you know, all the internet related things. Going back to kind of that question I asked you earlier in the hour, you know, when you've looked at something or listened to something, you know, through your computer, how do you know who wrote it? How do you know what their agenda is? You know, and, and how do you know that, that it was factual at all? Um, quick story about that. Um, my wife is a is retired also, but she's a journalism professor, PhD, tenured journalism professor. And she actually, you know, has done everything from teaching young people how to write news to how to do a public relations and crisis communications. Well, you should have brought her on the show, man. Well, I, I know she's better than I am. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. Oh, she charges too much. Believe me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, far, far too expensive to deal with her. But, it, but, you know, years ago when the internet, you know, f- first came about, which would be what, you know, say 15 years ago or so. Um, I remember her complaining um, about her students doing term papers. And she would say like, you know, look, I can't get these, these, these people here, they're college seniors. And I can't get them to the, do, you know, traditional research anymore. I can't get them into the library. They're not picking up books to do their term papers. They're just doing everything online. Not only that, but you know, they'll, they'll, they'll cite the wackiest, you know, make the wackiest statements in their papers. And I'll say, where did you, you know, where did you get that information? Well, I got it off the media. You know, I got it off the internet without them going back and starting to say like, okay, how verified is that? So, you know, I think back when you had fewer sources, there were more mainstream sources, essentially they were wealthy sources, CBS, ABC, NBC, the New York Times, your local newspaper, your local, you know, big city daily newspaper. You know, they had you know, a, a tremendous amount of brand equity. They had resources to work with. 
they had standing in the community. They had ethics they needed to uphold. They had reputations. They had brand equity. Um, and and what, what my wife was finding, essentially, is that students were really starting not to discern the quality of what they were reading uh, on, the, on the internet and where it came from. So you know, I think that's a huge issue. Look at the election, depends on who you believe about the 2016 election, but if you look at federal investigators and the FBI, you know, and other, you know, very, very normally regarded as serious federal, you know, uh, law enforcement agencies, they claim that the Russian government, of course, uh, you know, tried to and did influence the uh, 2016 presidential election by putting up hundreds of thousands and millions of posts that essentially were propaganda, you know, and they essentially, they were spoofed. They were um, made to look like they were statements by U.S. citizens or really they were part of a propaganda farm coming from, from Russia. So, you know, I, I think there's a terrible, um, you know, sense of not being aware of what you're really reading these days. That's one thing. And then also, I think what Craig seems to be most concerned about is sort of this echo chamber thing. You know, the fact that it allows you to, um, to, to just be extreme in your opinions and to seek out information and essentially opinion online or, you know, on cable TV or broadcast radio that just reinforces what your mindset is and you're not as open you know, to other people really trying to, you know, say, hey, you're full of, uh, you know, you're full of crap and you want to look at things a different way. Or not. Does that make yeah, sense? I think, I think that's, yeah, I think that's one of my concerns is, you know, I think that there's outright lies in the media and, and people tell lies on TV and, and anchors don't correct them. And, yep. and they spin it in a way that fits the agenda. And, um, you know, I'm more conservative leaning, but I'm not beating up only on on the on uh, CNN and MSNBC. Fox sure. Fox does the same kind of things. Can I tell a quick one about that? Because if you talk about the idea of outright lies and trying to influence public, you know, politics just blatantly, you know, play political roles and not be balanced, you know, I I think it's probably more critical than it ever has been, but it's been around for a long, long time. I mean, if me. Maybe we can see this in perspective. I looked up another thing that, you know, I always think that's really interesting. Take yourself back to 1897, back to the newspaper age. And there was a, this guy who was incredibly powerful as a publisher and incredibly rich from his newspapers, William Randolph Hearst. You've heard of him, haven't oh, you? Yeah. you know? yes, okay. Yes. He was the, you know, and, and basically Hearst had all of these, uh, you know, newspapers and they were extremely partisan across the country. And there was this artist, Frederick Remington, who brought life to great American images of the West. He did incredible Western paintings. And Hearst hired Remington to be an illustrator for his newspapers. And um, there was a revolution erupting in Cuba. And Hearst was basically saying, hey, the US ought to intervene. And he, he was really in favor of a, a war, uh, you know, essentially the Spanish-American War. So. Hearst dispatched his illustrator, Remington, this famous guy, to Cuba to see what was going on. And Remington wrote back to Hearst one day in January of 1987. He said, everything is quiet. There is no trouble. There will be no war. I wish to return. And Hearst, the publisher, wrote back to him and said, please remain. You furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. <laughs> And, you know, before very long, yes, and that was the idea. You had the, the the whole story sort of blown on perspective about the sinking of a U.S. ship called the Maine. Remember the Maine, and that kind of led to the Spanish-American War. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I and, don't doubt that know, it's gone on for a long time. I'm, yeah. I hear you there. But you know, I think with the idea that you've got that times, you know, a hundred, that times a thousand in terms of the you know, sheer the reach, volume of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the ability to do this. And also, we hadn't talked too much about the economics of it. It's cheap to do. You know, we can have this cast, although you guys, like, have this elaborate broadcast studio. You built this huge new building to do this podcast from. You know, you have this huge staff that, you know, puts these things together. That would be um, great. <laughs> <laughs> you broadcasting back from your tool shed that we talked hey, about here. there's a rake you know, in the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... You know, 
one thing we haven't talked about, you know, where's a lot of the motivation of this? Well, certainly, you know, trying to, trying to, uh, you know, to, to, to further a particular political agenda, that's certainly there. Economics. I mean, you know, one of the reasons that you try to, you know, do what you do in terms of your broadcast and maybe put on real extreme positions is it makes people very dedicated to listen to you hour after hour and makes it much more lucrative to sell commercials. You know, it's these things by and large, except for public broadcasting, bless its heart, public radio, public television, these are commercial media and people are selling ads or they're selling subscriptions or doing something like that to make about it. Yeah, that's just disappointing. You know, you talk about making money. It's almost like we're selling our souls as a country for the almighty dollar because we're trying to get viewers and listeners to our news channels as opposed to reporting the news as it actually is. And which, and, at which point it has, a person has to say, and that's new since when? Yeah, yeah, but I think it's more prevalent these yeah, days. Yeah, and yeah. Outright, I mean, there's just, sometimes, you know, I'm watching news on this coronavirus. I'm just sickened by the news report because I know I've watched other places and, and, and this particular one has spanned it in such a way. Like yeah. the thing with the, the senators who sold their, who sold their stock after getting the coronavirus brief. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, CNN didn't mention that Dianne Feinstein, the Democrat, did the same thing. You know, they reported the Republicans did it. <laughs> it's like, now, come now, on, guys. Well, I will say, in fairness, um, watching MSNBC, they did point out Feinstein as well and a couple of the other ones. So, and it was almost, I think, of the five or six who allegedly did this, they kind of break down half and half. So, yeah, I think that's one way to sort of measure the temperature of the newscast that you're watching in a, in no matter which bucket of medium, you know, it falls into, are they giving you balance like that and saying, yeah, Hey, you got people on both sides of the aisle who are cashing in. Uh, yeah. What would, you, what would you say about this? There's probably some out there that believe, you know, the, the media has a long, long history of leaning left. And so now what you've got is finally the Fairness Act is gone and we can level the playing field and get a right leaning thing out there to finally over many, many years, you know, get uh, get some balance here. You I've heard some people um, and, and largely making the case for public broadcasting um, argue that, you know, if you sense a left leaning bias in the media, um, one answer could be, yeah, you're right. Um, and, and, and that argument goes this way. I've heard it said, like, if you look at the fact that in their, in their role as gadfly, as in their role of muckraker, that media will tend to press against um, the lawmakers, against the government, against the people who, in char who are in charge uh, of whatever, a city, a county, a state, a business, um, and that those people tend to be ones who have the most control over the economics of a situation. Um, you know, media, especially reporters, if you're talking about journalism, do tend to fight against that. They try to be, you know, counteract that. They try to um, essentially, um, uh, in, in some instances, many instances, try to look out for the least of these, the people who normally don't have access to the media, who are not the gatekeepers, who are not the agenda setters. And so, uh, you know, they get the reputation for having that sort of bias. So if you're looking at people who really, you know, a, a lot of, I think, really, really good journalism deals with issues now of the poor, okay? Um, I think there are many issues that are and should be on the public agenda now talking about income distribution. Sometimes those things are, are, um, are discussed from a conservative perspective, but a libertarian perspective, but many, many times from a liberal perspective. So. You know, again, I, th there is some truth to it, uh, and uh, I think again, it all depends. How about that for an answer? It depends. It depends. It on depends. Where hey, can I make a point when uh, both of you are talking about coming back to the coronavirus thing? I think that one thing you know is worth uh, noticing, and it very much deals with psychology and emotions. Think of the people who are sitting in New York City at you know, the, the, uh, as we're recording this piece, sort of at the hub of the coronavirus outbreak. Ground zero. Yeah, and I believe the reporting indicates, you know, a factual reporting that New York City now has uh, essentially half of the coronavirus outbreak cases, documented cases of the entire U.S. Mm -hmm. um, New York 
Washington, Boston, are essentially, and LA are essentially the media hubs of the United States, but especially New York, right? Guilty is charged. The people sitting in those markets doing national reporting with their lives at risk, with their spouses at risk, with their kids at risk, are extremely emotionally stressed. And that comes through in their reporting and their you know, their anxiety is just absolutely market. By the way, they are doing one hell of a job. I cannot imagine trying to do a newscast, um, say at five o'clock in the morning, when you're wearing makeup, you're still sleepy, somebody jams contacts in your eyes, you're under hot lights, you're, you know, and you have, and you're working in different studios, different camera people, half of your producers are sick, and you're getting these dire reports of your neighbors essentially becoming sick and being hauled off to the hospital and that you may be next. You know, they're working under extreme stress. It's, it's sort of like wartime reporting. And I think that has a lot to do with the, the dire nature of what's being reported, the power of it. Um, I think there is some, bless their hearts, I think they're doing wonderful reporting and it's obviously, a, you know, a world changing story. But the, there is something to the idea that if the prime outbreak were in rural Utah, uh, and it was being, ha you know, and they were having to have a different with, tone, maybe, huh? Yeah, it, certainly it would be covered, but it would have a different tone and a different sense of intensity. Yeah, I think that we don't consider that to some extent, you know, the these, you know, the other side of it, when we're criticizing the media and whatnot, you know, the the difficulty in that, I mean, you know, people are going around the world into crazy countries and da dangerous places to bring, you know, the news, to bring uh, the, the facts of what's going on in the ground. And, and that concerns me. That That's one of the things that I have concern. I guess I'll tip my hand because I'm aware of the time and we get to jump at it here. Yep. You know, the, the term fake news gets bantied around a lot, uh, I guess probably coined by Trump. Uh, but it's but it's a direct sort of, uh, you know, it, it it seems like a pot shot back and forth that gets taken adversarially between the media and our government nowadays. First of all, I guess that's not exactly new. You spoke to that earlier, right? Sure. Another one that comes right. to mind, of course, is Richard Nixon, who hated the media and always said he was being treated unfairly by the media and being lied at. And, and, and remember, you had Mr. Nixon saying, I am not a crook. Yeah. He was right? A crook. And he was. <laughs> he was a crook. When he yeah. was. Yeah. Well, what do you think about the term fake news and the, you know, the dynamics that that creates? Uh, you know, it's, I guess I would, it's a really good question. I, I think the term fake news is fake. I'll put it that way. You know, the fake news is fake uh, in many ways. I, I would be very skeptical as a consumer of news if you just hear somebody calling something fake news and then they move on. They really don't give, I, I think a lot of, times when we're hearing especially officials now using the term fake news they use it they drop that bomb and that way they don't have to discuss any of the or justify their opinions offer alternative really fact-based facts uh they just move on does that make any sense it, it's i think it does and it goes it goes to the other thing that i really wanted to get in before we end up here because we got a taxi in here uh you know the the, the issue between facts and opinion i i feel like there is so 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 much opinion yep that is our news it, like we don't like i think that's one of the things that craig you said earlier that you get frustrated with the most we don't get news we get opinions op-eds are the basic that's op-eds are basically all we get yep fairness doctrine you know went away so, you could do that you know and basically by offering a lot of opinion getting people steamed up hour after hour it increased your audience increased your revenue increased your advertising increased the amount of money you made so, so I was a kid before the Fairness Act. I mean, I, I was born in 73 and grew up in the 80s. And I guess I really didn't care to watch the news so much. Uh, are, can you characterize how opinion was or was not a part of the news then? Uh, I think it was, there was much more of an effort made, so you held onto your broadcast license, to separate news from opinion. You know, TV stations especially had 
editorial stations editorials but they yeah put up a yeah i remember that saying editorial and basically and you can it, say it, whatever it, you want well, within reason it grew out of you know essentially the way the newspapers handle it and, and most of them still do handle it you have reporters who go out to try to uh you know question government and probe the facts and report the facts okay find out as best they can what are the facts of the situation and how do you verify them how do you get multiple sources for a story uh, you know, to verify what's going on. And then you have the people who are on the editorial board who are not in the newsroom, but they get together and they say, this is the view of the paper, essentially at, as a corporation, but it's not of the newsroom. And basically where I think we're all kind of feeling uneasy is when it became good business, it was cheap to do, by the way, Okay, if you just get on the air for two hours and spot about your opinion, you're not having to pay reporters to go out in the field. It's cheap. It's very um, and 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 the more sort of especially for you know less latched on viewers and listeners you've got who really, you know, back your point of view, uh, it makes them listen to you longer, watch you longer, and that increases your revenue. It's cheap to do, and it has a really it really uh, creates a very loyal audience. And therefore, people who are very extreme in their views, because by God, they heard it. They heard it in the media. Wow. Well, we got to wrap this up, Craig. Um, uh, what are you thinking? What do you hear? How do we taxi in for a landing here? Um, well, I think we could talk a lot longer. You know, I just from, from where I'm coming from, man, I just uh, I'm not anti-media, but I want anchors and news people to ask those questions of government officials like uh, Roger's talking about equally. You know, I'm more conservative leaning, but um, you know, I've heard George Bush called a war criminal and all that stuff. If he's a war criminal, he should be tried for that. You know, R uh, Richard Burr just sold that stock. He ought to be investigated for that. And if he's found guilty, he ought to go to jail, you know? So I, I so I am more conservative. And the reason I say those things is because I think we ought to hold these politicians accountable, whether they're Democrat or Republican. And I'd like to see a news media that, that felt the same way and did ask those probing questions. And the other point I'll make is, you know, this coronavirus, and this is, this is probably more politics than news, but you know, the coronavirus I've, I've seen has brought some people together, right? So I saw Trump praising uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, who's the governor of California. Yeah, and that was pretty amazing. And Cuomo, and Cuomo too. Yeah. And Cuomo, saw, yeah. And I saw Cuomo praise Trump. And yeah, I he could, did. I, I couldn't believe it. And I, you know, <laughs> watching Cuomo, I, I disagree with a lot of things he says, but dude, I was totally impressed with his, uh, with his, uh, with his press conferences and the way he's, the way he's handling a situation in New York. I think it's fantastic. And I'd like to live in a world where we could say, well, Hey, this guy over here is on the other side of the fence, but he's making some good points. And, Let's figure out how we can make something work together. And things are so polarized, including our media, that it just seems like such a stretch, man. Roger, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you an editing, uh, gatekeeping reality here. We're going to give you one minute and forty two seconds to sum up and respond to what Craig says. Go. <laughs> I was going to say, listening to Craig, I would say, Amen. You know, I hope for a lot of the things that he hopes for. I'm disappointed in the media when, again, it gets hyperpartisan or uh, or unreasoned or or not fact based. And I would say to you, wouldn't it be great uh, if if politicians routinely these days exhibited, I think, what you'd call what rational adult behavior? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And and Chris, how you know, don't you don't you need to bring that you know have them you know act and react in in sort of their adult personas? Um, oh yes, instead of the child uh, regression, sure, yeah. <laughs> right. What a world it would be. That's my summation. Roger, Roger, thirty seconds. What do you think would be a great improvement? Like if you if you could wave a magic wand. Here's a therapy question for you. Wave a magic wand. What could you make pop? different for the media that would be helpful i mean you got you got such vast experience in your head what what would what would make media better mm. i can't get over today thinking of the coronavirus i guess i was going to say have donald trump cuomo gavin newsom 
Nancy Pelosi and, uh, and Mitch McConnell all stand in front of that hospital that's having such terrible trouble in Queens, overrunning, uh, uh, literally holding hands, looking at each other and saying, we'll do whatever it takes to hold this country together and make as many people uh, safe and healthy as we possibly can. I and mean it. And act on it. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, there's a lot going on in the world today. I appreciate and thank you, sir, for the media experience that you have brought I uh, over, over the many years. You know, it, it, it's such a valuable part of our community. Uh, we like to criticize the media, but as you say, it's, you know, the fourth, the fourth wing of, of what we have. It, I don't, I, I think the world would be a, a really a scary place without, without the media. So thank you, sir, for, for what you've done for our community over the, the many years that you've been involved with it. Did we actually lose him again? I think we lost him again. <laughs> I hope you heard that. I hope, I think the well, last time that he said uh, he was listening uh, and, and uh, there, I think he came back, yeah. you know, he, he heard our voices and everything. So uh, did you, you heard us that whole time, sir? Roger. Uh oh, he said he looks like he's not hearing us. Where <laughs> we, we have lost connection, I guess. One two, one two. Can you guys hear? Yeah, we got yeah, you. He's back. <laughs> <laughs> and he's gone again. <laughs> can you see? Right, well, I can see you. Uh, it there. hung up again, guys. I'm sorry, but it just did what it did. All right. Craig, you're going to get it back, and I'm going to say thanks again, uh, Roger, for what you have done for uh, the media in the last uh, many years that you've been a part of uh, doing such a difficult and important task for our service. Craig, you want to take us out of here? Yeah, man. You can find out more about the show on com. What's next, Chris? Uh, dude. I don't know. We got some interviews that uh, I've got in, 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 in my mind. Uh, we do have uh, Aaron Clark, who did committed to be on One, show, two. friend of the show. Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> yes, he is back. Um, so we got we got Aaron Clark coming back on uh, at some point. Craig, I know you're going to love uh, some stuff on uh, medication and things that we probably have coming up. So we got a lot of cool One, stuff. One, two. One, two. Roger is checking his mic. Greg, <laughs> we got him back. You, you left us and you came back. So we were just wrapping up, Roger, but I just wanted to say thank you for the service that you have done uh, for our community. In Hello, what is it? one, two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're out. <laughs> All right. Wow. You, you're going to pull that together, Craig? <laughs> I will.